So let's finish up our notes here. We have a couple more free response questions that I'd like to go through. All right, let's see. So, uh, yeah, just a reminder here. What you have is a combination. What you started with plus what you've accumulated minus how much you've lost. That kind of makes sense. I mean, where did you start? How much did you gain? How much did you lose over that time? We'll tell you how much you still have. So as we move on to example six, right off the bat, my math voice jumps for joy because I get to use my calculator. Let's try to read through before we even attack the question. Let's see how many little notes we can leave to ourselves and reminders about uh, hints that they gave us without explicitly giving those hints. So there's 700 people on the 700 people in line for a popular amusement ride when the ride begins operation in the morning. Once it begins operation, the ride accepts passengers until the park closes eight hours later. When there is a line, people move on to the ride at a rate of 800 people per hour. The graph shows the rate R of T at which people arrive at the ride throughout the day. Time is measured in hours. So right away, I've got units. Let's go back and try to highlight. I kind of just wanted to read it through first, and now I'll go back and highlight things that are important. So they tell us that there are 700 people in line. What is this telling us? That's the beginning. That's what, it, what we're talked up here when you have a combination of what you started with. So this is what you began with. We had 700 people in line before they ever started to uh, open the ride up. Begins operation in the morning. Once it begins operation, the ride accepts passengers until the park closes eight hours later. Okay, that makes sense. Here the, uh, the line is not getting any longer at eight because they stopped. Sorry, no one is showing up at the ride anymore because that's what r of t is so let's highlight well we'll highlight them in order when there's a line people move on to the ride at a rate of 800 i'm going to uncircle all of that so what does this represent when there while there is a line people move on to the ride at a rate of 800 people per hour this is how much the line is decreasing or how much you're losing, right? The, how fast people get on the ride is going to shorten the, or at least take people out of the line. It might not shorten it depending on how many people are showing up, but that's what that's talking about. And over here, it's actually kind of nice to graph this one. If you can graph where that is, so the rate at which people are leaving is constant. Uh, how do I line? is decreasing rate at which rate where how about that rate where the line is decreasing the graph shows the rate r of t at which people arrive so i want to highlight that the graph shows r of t which is the rate at which people arrive so r of t is is making the line is uh people arriving How do we know if the line's getting longer or shorter? Well, if you have more people arriving compared to how many people are getting off the getting out of line and onto the ride, if you have more people arriving, you're going to be lines getting longer. If you have less people arriving than the how fast they're uh, put on the ride, then it's going to be getting shorter. Uh, one more thing. This is so. This is I'm going to put at the rate at which people arrive, and then. Yeah, okay, there we go. So that's pretty much all the giveaways that I saw. Now we can finally start to answer the question. How many people arrive at the ride between T equals zero and T equals three? They should have put hours at the end of that, huh? Mm -hmm. So um, I would have tried to integrate this from zero to three. That would have been um, – um oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. There's two ways you can get a little bit messed up on this one. How many people arrive at the ride? Is that saying how many people are in line or how many people have showed up since then? 
So you be careful on the way this is written. My first instinct was to start at 700 and then go up from there. But if I start at 700 and then integrate, that's going to tell me not how many people arrive, but how many people are in line. We want to know how many people arrive. So one way to think about this, if you integrate R of T DT, let's think of what that looks like in units. R of T is how fast people arrive throughout the, the day. So that's people per hour. That's a rate, it said, times what is DT? Well, D means change in, T means time, so that's hour. If you cross multiple, or sorry, if you cancel here, your eight hours will cancel out, and you'll get the number of people in line. So I want to, I don't want to know how many people, dang it, I said that wrong again. That's just going to be people. That's going to be people. So when I integrate, that's how many people have arrived between t equals 0 and t equals 3. So the integral from t equals 0 to t equals 3 of r of t dt. Now, we don't have a function. Even though this is calculator permitted, we don't have a function to just type this in. So we're kind of out of luck there. We've got to use the graph to figure out. So from 0 to 3, I'm going to encourage you to pause and try to figure out what that integral from zero to three would be. Let's see how you did it. I'm going to break this into two trapezoids. This trapezoid and then this trapezoid. Now remember, you could break these into rectangles with triangles at the top if you want to go that route, or you can do trapezoids. So the, my first trapezoid, remember the trapezoid formula is one half height times base one plus base two. So my height in this case is 2 times base 1, which would be 1,000, plus height 2, which would be 1,200, plus, then I got to go from 2 to 3, that's trapezoid again, 1 half. My height this time is only 1, and then it's 1,200 plus 800, which we could stop there, right? Well, not quite. You'd have to write some units afterward. If you wanted to stop here, you could. You'd put a bracket around it and then write what unit it is. So what is this a unit of? It'd be people. You could stop there. But since I have my calculator, I'm going to keep going just in case I need this later on. So that'd be 1,000 plus 1,200 plus 2,000 times a half. 3,200. So between when the park opened and the third hour after it opened, 3,200 people got in line. All right, what's next? Is the number of people waiting in line to get on the ride increasing or decreasing between 2 and 3? So between 2 and 3. So I have to compare the number of, I have to look at the rate and think about how things, how do we decide if a rate is increasing or decreasing? So if I'm looking at this picture here, I need to compare how fast people are getting in line in comparison to how fast people are getting out of line. So the number of people waiting in line to get the, to, on the ride increasing or decreasing. So. Here's the number, the, the rate at which people are getting off. The people are getting into the, into, the, um, into the ride. This is how fast they're getting in line. Well, if the, how fast they're getting in line, oh, dang it. This is the rate of how fast people are getting onto the ride. This is the rate of how fast people are getting in line. Well, if the rate of people getting in line is larger than the rate at which people are getting out of line, then what's happening to the line? Is it getting longer or shorter? Obviously, it's getting longer. So uh, how do we want to write this up? Is the number of people waiting in line to get on the ride increasing or decreasing? I like to always put it back the way they said it. The number of people in line is increasing between... times t equals 2 hours 
and t equals three hours. And they did say justify, so we got to say a little bit because what could we say? Well, we could say that the rate of which people are getting in line is, lo is larger than them getting out of line. So what do we call the rate of people getting in line? That's what we've defined as R of T. R of T is greater than, and we didn't define this, so we can't just say some function for this, but we don't need to define it. It's just the number 800. So because R of T is greater than 100, 800, when? When? we got to get specific for the interval that we we're talking about. Uh, I would say it's something like this for all T that are an element of two to three hours. At what time T is the line for the ride the longest? How many people are in the line at that time? So let's just kind of think it through first. If you were to guess, where would you think the line is the longest? If I were to make a prediction, pause and try to think, just point to it, and, or just take the next two seconds and point where you think it's going to be. If I were to make a prediction, lots of people, including my past self, would have pointed to this spot right here. Because that seems like, okay, that's where the line is the longest. No, that's when the rate of people getting on the line is increasing the most. It has nothing to do with how long the line is. So what's happening from here to there? Well, the rate at which people are getting in line are always above the rate at which people are getting out of line, which is this orange line, this orange line that we drew here. What does all this represent? These are the rates that people are getting in line, but that rate is smaller than the rate at which people are getting out of line and getting on the ride. So line gets longer, 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 longer. Line gets shorter, shorter, shorter. So the longest has to be at that moment right there, not there. That's the fastest. That's the, the, the maximum at which people were, the maximum rate at which people were getting into line. So let's see if we can figure this out. Or let's try to write this up. At what time T is the line for the ride the longest? The line is longest at time T equals three hours. Because, and I guess the best way to say it is the line, the rate at which people are showing up is always bigger than 800 here and then always less than 800 here. So the line is longest at time T equals three because the rate at which people are showing up, R of T, is greater than 800 for all time. Dang it. I hate when I run out of room. T, which is an element of zero to three hours so from zero to three hours the rate is longer and r of t is less than 800 for all times for all time t that's an element of three until how long how long should we stop we don't want to say infinity till eight hours the line is longest at time equals three because the rate of people getting in line is bigger than the rate of them getting out for everything before three hours. And then everything after three hours, that line has got to be getting shorter because that rate is lower. Now, notice we're not done with this one. How many people are in line at that time? So the number of people, I'm going to uh, uh, keep it purple, I guess. Number of people in line. Now, this isn't how many people have showed up, the rate at which they're going. So I'm not going to just plug, look at this and say, okay, the answer is 800. No, that's the rate at which people are showing up. I need to compare how many people have showed up plus how many people have accumulated since then. Let me try that again. I have to, If I want to figure out how many people are actually in line, that's a combination of what we started with plus what we've accumulated minus how much we've lost. So why don't you try to think about what that would look like based on all the info that we have. See if you can come up with a quick statement, mathematical statement that describes what we're trying to say. Pause it if you haven't yet. All right, let's see how you did. So 
What did we start with? How many people did we start with in line? We started with 700 people. How many people have we accumulated? In other words, how many people have gotten in line for those first three hours from time zero to time three? That would be the integral from zero to three of RTDT. Minus how many people are getting out of line. So how fast are people getting out of line again? 800 people per hour. Well, how many hours have gone by? So 800 times three would represent how many people have been leaving the line. So that's 700 plus, I think we did this up above, yep, 3,200. Take away 2,400. And if you want to just put parentheses here and write people, you can stop. I'm going to use my calc to finish this one off. 3,200 minus 2,400 plus 700. I got 1,500. Dang it. 1,500 people. A lot of people. So when the line is the longest, there are 1,500 people. If you just got in line at hour three, you have 1,500 people to get on that ride before you get your chance to ride. All right. Write but do not solve an equation involving an integral, integral expression of R whose solution gives the earliest time at which there is no longer a line for the ride. Well, my first instinct when I looked at this was, well, it's eight hours, right? No, that means that that just means that the rate at which people are showing up is zero. So nobody else is showing up at eight o'clock because what happened at eight o'clock? They shut down all the rides or at least shut down the gate. So at this spot, they, the line is ended. So they, they, the ride accepts passengers until the park closes at eight. So if you're in line at eight, you still get to go on the ride. But if you try to get in line at eight, they're not letting you in. So that's why the, this is zero. It's not because there are zero people in line. It's because the rate at which people are getting in line is zero. So we want to figure out when the number of people in the line, the number of people in line equals zero. So we have to somehow figure out how we can add together or combine things to figure out the number of people in line. Well, we just kind of talked about this up here. We came up with this sort of relationship, what we started with, what we've accumulated, what we've lost. So now let's try to make an equation for that. Sorry, turn this into a uh, just kind of an equation that equals zero. Now, we don't want to use three because that's a specific time. We don't know what time it is. So ours would look something like 700 you started with from zero to what time? We don't know. That's what we're trying to solve. Whose solution gives the earliest time T. That's what we're trying to find. Well, now what's our argument, our, our integrand? We, we can't call it R of T again because we just used T to represent the time. So you can't have a T here and then a T there. So you could pick any letter. I'm going to be boring and just pick X, but I should pick something else. So this is how many people I started with. This is how many people we've accumulated up to whatever time that is. Minus how fast are people leaving? We're leaving. We're losing 800 people per hour, so 800. And for us, we don't know what the hours is, so we'd call that T. And we want this amount of people to equal what? Zero. Pretty tough. Pretty tough. I'm interested to see how the scoring stats went for that. Let's see, the 2010, number three. AP Calc, 2010, free response. I always get the scoring guidelines. I have a hard time finding the actual points. Here's our proofs. Yeah, look at that. They used S. Ah, chumps. I wish I could find the, what would I write in? The scoring statistics? There we go. 2010. This was what? Number three. Average score was people got two points out of that. Two points. Think you could beat two points? I hope so.
I hope so. I would think we could at least be two points. Maybe, man, if you can imagine getting six points on that bad boy, everybody else is getting two, you're going to you're gonna increase your chances of getting that high score. I would say the nastiness, I thought this one was pretty tough. I didn't think this one was too bad. That one was real. That's easy. That's definite. And I thought this one wasn't too bad either. Now, that helped that we did this one, though, to get us to that one. Anyway, all right, let's move on. Ooh, we got some snow coming on here. Suppose we variable rates of accumulation within and between, blah, blah, blah. He's got some piecewise functions. Oh, what a dirty rat. Oh, it's not him. He just stole this from AP. So this is the same year. Let's see how many people. Let's see the score before we even start on this one. Ooh, not bad. 3.67. So people almost got over almost four average on this one. Okay, so let's see. Right off the bat, I would encourage you to try to do this on your own. But if you wanted me to do all the heavy lifting, I guess you can. But remember, your muscles aren't going to get any bigger by me doing the heavy lifting for you. Calculator permitted. That's good news. There is no snow on Janet's driveway. Janet's got some snow coming when the snow begins to fall at midnight. From midnight, midnight to 9 a.m., snow accumulates on the driveway at a rate of F of T equals blah, 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 cubic feet per hour. So there's my first hint. I've got units. And most um, free response questions, I think, usually, not, not most, I shouldn't say, but anyone that has like an, uh, a real story like this is going to have some units. Where T is measured in hours since midnight. So that's an important thing to kind of highlight. T stands for hours since midnight. So hour one is, yeah, that makes sense, right? So if I put in nine, that would be 9 a.m. because that's how many hours there has been since midnight. Janet starts removing snow. So there's our first, there's our, this is our accumulation up here. Here's our removing, our, our the amount that we're losing along the way at six. So she gets up bright and early and gets out there and starts shoveling some snow. The rate, G of T, then we have this other factor. Okay, so this is her, G of T is the amount that Janet removes. So this is Janet removing snow. This is how fast she removes snow. Kind of makes sense, right? Because between zero and six, why does that make sense that G of T would be zero? That's when the snow is falling and she's sleeping, right? This. Snow accumulating. So then she, so the snow's been dropping since midnight. She gets out at 6 a.m. It's been dropping, so it's, she hasn't been able to remove any. She's now removing 125, what is the units here? Cubic feet per hour. So for that first hour from 6 to 7 a.m., she gets rid of 125 cubic feet. I don't know if that's a lot or not, but it sounds like a lot. And then for the next two hours, she's kind of tired. She slows down, but she's still getting rid of 108 cubic uh, feet per hour for the next two hours. All right, let's give it a whirl. So what do we know first? So the first question, how many cubic feet of snow have accumulated on the driveway? So accumulated is how much snow you actually have. So... How much snow is there to begin with? None, right? So we don't have to worry about that. So we can start with the integral from zero until, from hour zero into hour six. Because that's what they want to know at 6 a.m. Now, when we integrate this, that's going to be f of t dt. Do we need to subtract off how much she's she's removing well, i mean you can if you want to but it's going to be zero because between zero and 6 a.m there was no snow to start with then a bunch of snow accumulated and then she removed zero snow in that time period all right so you can do this i'm going to do this on my calc you could oh no i don't even want to attempt to integrate that i'm definitely going to do this now, this is one of those where I feel like I'm going to use this function many times. So I'm going to input that into my y equals. 
So 7x e to the cosine of x. And that way I can just use that as my, remember how we can use that y1? Also, before I go any further, as soon as I see a trig thing, I think, man, I better check my mode. And 99% of the time, you want to be in radians. You pretty much only want don't want to be in radians if the story is obviously in degrees or if you're trying to uh, do like a sine inverse, cosine inverse to try to figure out an actual value. All right, so we want to do this. Zeros I don't care about, so I can go to math. Is it math 9? Yep, math 9. Zero until 6 of, and now I'm going to put y1 in there. Oops. Come on. Remember that's alpha 4. Alpha F4, there's Y1, and we're derive, integrating according to X, and it spits back 142.274. 142.274. How come I just lost a point? Units. So what are our units? How much snow has accumulated? That's cubic feet. Doug. I wish I would have put the F first, but I put the T, and then I had to squeeze it in, but whatever. Find the rate of change of the volume of the snow on the driveway at 8 a.m. So the rate of change of the volume. So I need to compare how much snow is falling on to the driveway and how much snow she is removing. And that's she's out there working by 8 a.m., so right between 7 and 9, she's removing at this rate. So this isn't going to be as easy as just figure it. It actually is pretty easy, but it's not an integral problem. We just need to compare the two rates. Compare accum versus remove. So we've got to compare how much, how fast it's accumulating to how fast she's removing it. So find the rate of change of the volume of the snow. So how, much, how fast is she accumulating? She's accumulating at a rate of f of t. And what time are we talking about at time t equals 8, 8, 8 hours? So we're comparing f of 8. That's how fast things are accumulating in the driveway. Minus how fast is she getting rid of stuff, which would be g of 8. Which equals, and then now I'm going to do this on my calculator. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna write this here, but I'm gonna write it underneath it, just to remind you guys that this is how it, you would do this at this point because we already store, stored f is y y one, so I would do alpha y one of eight, and that's like taking. That's like taking 8 and plugging it into the f function because we've already stored y1 as our f function. Minus 108, which ends up being negative 59.582. I need some units. So what does this represent? How much it's accumulating versus how much it's removing. So is she winning right now? Yeah, she's winning, isn't she? She's beating Mother Nature at this point because she's removing the, the comparison of accumulation take away uh, how fast she's getting rid of it is negative. So what are our units? This is how fast she's removing. So that's cubic feet per hour. This is sort of a note out of interest. Janet is beating... Mother Nature. So right now, Janet's winning. So let's say they, I think that's it, right? Find the rate of change. Let's say they said to justify. If they said to justify, we would say if need to justify. Or maybe not even justify, but write up. Maybe not justify, but if we need to write up, a write up would look something like the volume of snow is what? Decreasing by 59.582 cubic feet per hour.
at 8 a.m. Something like that would be a nice little write-up. But they didn't ask for that. They just wanted to know the amount. Or oh, sorry, the rate of change. All right, let's move on. Let H of T, so we got this new function, represents the total amount of snow in cubic feet that Janet has removed from the driveway at time T hours after midnight. Express H as a piecewise defined function with domain 0 to 9. So that makes sense that we've got to do a piecewise because her rate of removing snow changes over time. So if we want to figure out how much snow Janet has removed, we need to write it as a piecewise function with three sections. So H of T, e ugh. H of T equals the piecewise function. All right, well, let's see. Let's think, start with the uh, how much snow has Janet removed in the first interval well she hasn't removed any right all the snow is just showing up zero four zero is less than or equal to t is less than six how much has she removed in the next segment well you got to be a little careful here and this is sneaky what I did the first time was I just wrote 125 right that's how much she has removed that's not true Oh, well, wait, let's make it 125T. That's not true because 125T means at hour one, when T equals one, she has removed 125. No, that's not true. She hasn't removed only 125. This is dependent on how, what hour, the hour, sorry, compared to, um, let me start over. Let's say I just wrote 125. Well, that means that for hours one, two, three, whatever, it would always be 125. It can't be 125 for all of these hours. It's going to be for the hours six, less than or equal to T, less than seven. Those are the hours that we want to focus on here. We need to compare that to how many hours it was versus where she started. So it's if I want to put, like, let's say I put hour six in. So right now at hour six, if I just left this, pretend like that T wasn't there. I don't want to erase it because I do need it. But let's say it just said 125. Well, that means at hour six, at 6 a.m., she has already removed 125. No, that's not true. At 100, She hasn't removed. At hour seven, she's removed 125. But we this range goes from six until seven. So that means at six, it would still need to be 125, and she hasn't removed that many. So I need to account for the fact that this is scaled off of this 6 o'clock start time. So I need to take away the 6 hours where she was sleeping from, zero, from midnight to 6 a.m. So now when I put 6 in there, look what happens. 6 minus 6 is 0. 0 times 125, that still means that she has moved. So when she gets all bundled up and goes outside with her shovel, she still has removed 0 cubic feet of snow at 6 a.m. But at 7 a.m., when I put 7 in there, 7 minus 6 is 1, 125 times 1. Now she's removed her 125 cubic feet of snow. With that as a hint, see if you can figure out what the last part would be. And don't forget in the last section, you have to account for how much snow she removed last time, too. She's already removed some snow by, the, by, by 7 a.m. All right, let's see how you did. So the next section would be... She removed 125. I'm going to put times one in there just to remind myself that she was removing snow at this rate for one hour. Plus, now she's starting to remove 108, but now we need to account from seven. So for uh, seven is less than or equal to T is less than um, nine. Not so easy. I would have not. I would get that wrong if I took the AP test. I could almost guarantee. Tough one. And then the last one, how many cubic feet of snow are on the driveway at 9 a.m.? So now we need to accumulate all the snow that, or figure out how much we have based on how much we started with, how much it accumulated, and how much was removed. The problem here is that things are getting removed at a different rate. They're accumulating at the same rate. But she's getting rid of things at a different rate. So when I want to figure out how much total snow there actually is, I'm going to integrate this, but I need to subtract off this at three different in three different segments. So let's start with the first section from hours 
0 until 6. How much snow did she, this is how much snow fell. How much snow did she remove? None. Plus, how much snow fell between 6 and 7? Will that be the integral from 6 until 7 of f of t dt? How much did she remove? One hundred twenty-five, because that was only for one hour. If that helps, you can put a one in there to help you understand that part. Plus, then from seven until nine, she has taken out one hundred eight for two hours. How much is landed? How much she removed? How much is landed? How much she removed? How much is landed? How much is she removed? If you wanted to clean this up, you could. If you didn't. You'd have to make sure that you include some units. I'm going to do this on my calc. Now, what's nice about this is this integral plus this integral plus this integral is really just the integral from 0 until 9. And then minus 125 and minus 216. Then I can go back to my trusty TI here. Math 9, from 0 until 9, of y1, dx, even though that's a y, minus 125 minus 216. I got 26 point something, I hope. Yep, good. 26.334. 26.334 cubic feet. It's interesting that this one scored more on it. The kids had a better average on this one than they did on the one before. I think this one's a lot tougher. All right, last one. Get her done. Oh, no. Math voice is a little bit sad. Well, this is 2010, too. Let's see how the average was on this one. We got it here. 2010, number five, 1.75 points. Really? Huh. Like I said, I feel like this one's easier than the ones before it, but maybe that's just me. The function G is defined and differentiable. Boom. Now, maybe we won't need this. What else does that mean about G if G is defined and differentiable? G is continuous. Who knows if we'll need that. Satisfies. Oh, here's another hint. G of 0 equals 5. So that's an initial condition. It's a beginning spot for us. The graph of y equals g prime, that's this. So that's the picture they've given us. Consists of a semicircle. So we've got a semicircle there. And three line segments. One, two, three. Okay, I see those as shown in the figure above. Find G of three. Well, my instinct was to integrate. Okay, if this is the graph of G prime and I wanted to figure out what's happening at G of three, well, I would integrate from zero to three. That's not enough. See if you can pause and think about why that's not enough. What would the integral from G my bad. What would be the integral? I'll write that up here. The integral from 0 to 3 of g prime of x would, equal, would tell me what? How much has accumulated from 0 to 3? That's how much I've gained from 0 to 3. Why is that not the same as what g of 3 is? Depends on where you started. And that's where this initial condition comes into play. So our initial condition says, so G of 3, G of 3 has to start off at G of 0, and then it accumulates that area under the curve. So then I would integrate from 0 to 3 of G prime of, should I use X or? Can I use X here? I guess it doesn't really matter because we've already plugged in 
I think if we left this as like G of X, then that would be X and that would be T's. I'd have to change them there. But All right, let's see. G of 0, they told us was 5. Plus, now I need to integrate from 0 to 3. That means I need to figure out the area under the curve from 0 to 3. Uh, let's just go through and do all the areas at this spot. I'm going to just highlight them. You can do them in pieces if you want. I'm going to just be done with it. and I, I'm guessing I'll need all the areas anyway. So what would this be? This would be 1 half base, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, times height, which is negative 1. So that's negative 5 halves. So this is negative 5 halves. This and this will be the same area, whatever those are. That's going to be a quarter of a circle. So that would be 1 fourth pi, right? Because it's pi r squared would be the area for the whole circle. And we're doing just a quarter of it. And then I'm going to write it over here as well. So 1 fourth pi times my radius, which is 2 squared. I like that. That's 4. That's 1 fourth. So that's just pi. So this area is pi. This area is pi. And this one, I wanted to be a little careful. When I did this the first time, I found the whole area. But then I got kind of I messed up and I had to go back and do it again. Because from 0 to 3 is this first. So I need to break this up. I need to stop at 3 and find its area and then do that area. So I'm going to do both of these areas. So this is still 1 half base, which is 1 times height, which is 3. So this would be 3 halves. And then again, 1 half, my base is, ooh, my base is 1.5. So that's 3 halves. And my height is 3. So that's what, 9 fourths? Yuck. Nine fourths. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back down here. So I want to integrate from zero to three. So from zero to three, the first is I've got the five already. My first that's pi plus three halves. You can stop here if you wanted to, or you could clean it up. Free response, right? And plus it's no calc. So you really could just stop here and box this in. I'm gonna I'm going to clean up because I like to, and I don't have to worry about getting it wrong because I can always look at the answer key, unlike you on the actual test. So 13 over 2 plus pi. I'm going to encourage you to try to do g of negative 2 on your own. All right. So pause it if you haven't. Let's see how you did. So that would be g of 0 again. I'm starting at 0. I'm going from 0 until negative 2. G prime of x dx, which equals, uh-oh, my math voice is yelling here. This thing's backwards, right? Now, there's two ways to do this. You can either account for the negative when you look up here, or you can flip this around. For my money, I flip it around. I just think it's easier for me to sort that out in my head. G of 0, we already know is 5. Take away. What's the integral from negative 2 to 0? Negative 2 to 0, that's pi. There we go. That's not too bad. I'm guessing, though, that's probably only one point, I bet. Bet you that's only one point. Which number is this? 5? Oh, three points there. Ba -ba Bow! Bow! Yes, did that, and then got our two answers, 13 halves over pi and 5 minus pi. Good job. Find the x-coordinate of each point of inflection of the graph. So let's stop there and go back and put a little highlighter up there, a reminder. How do you find points of inflection? I'm going to pause here. I'm going to encourage you to pause if you haven't, if you can't write it down super quick. How do we find points of inflection? Points of inflection occur when, I'm just going to write F double prime. I know it's not. When F double prime switches signs. Now, remember, that's not enough to just say switches signs, but it's enough to remind us of the process. We should really say F double prime switches from positive to negative or something like that. 
or vice versa. Find the x-coordinate of each point of inflection of the graph of y prime on the interval negative 7 to 5. So that's all the way through. So we first have to figure out what? Find where our points, our possible points of inflection are going to occur where, now I am going to go back to the right letters, G double prime equals what or what? G double prime equals zero or D and E. So what are our possible places? This is not, I was just stumped there for a second because I looked at this and said that should be, no, that's not. I mean, yeah, I could, uh, sorry, sorry, it is, it is. I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. Let's just make a list. So where are the places where we equally either equal zero? Let's do these first. Where does G double prime, where does the slope equal zero? The only one I have that has a slope of zero is at zero. Where does um, where does G double prime not exist? That equals X at, I can't derive it negative two. I can't derive it two. I can't derive at three. So those four places are the possible, these are my possible points of inflection. Now for us to figure out where the actual points of inflection are, what has to happen? F double prime has to switch sign there. And that's why I was kind of ready to ignore this. What's the slope here? What's happening to F prime or G prime here? Am I saying F or G? Good. What's happening to G prime? G prime is increasing. What's happening here? G prime is increasing. So G double prime, get a different color that'll show up a little bit better. G double prime is greater than zero. What's happening here? G double prime is greater than zero. What's happening here? G double prime is less than zero, so boom. Right away, we know that this is a this is a point of inflection because G double prime switches signs. What is G double prime here? Greater than zero. What is G double prime here? Less than zero. So coming down here to make our actual arguments. So what's the question again? Find the X coordinate of each point of inflection. points of inflection x equals 0 x equals 2 x equals 3 and we need to explain our reasoning because g double prime switches from all right which one let's go positive and negative first from positive to negative at, okay, so increase, increase, decrease. So the first one is zero. Decrease, increase, decrease. The next one would be three. And then we could also say G double prime. Oh man, I'm going to run out of room. Switches from negative to positive at x equals 2. So there would be our, this would be our actual answer here, this side. That stuff was just to help me figure out where those possible POIs would occur. All right, last part. The function h is defined by h of x equals g of x, so that's the graph, minus 1 half x squared. Find the x-coordinate of each critical point of h and classify each critical point as the location of relative min, max. Oh, that's easy. You should try this one on your own. Pause if you haven't. Pause and try to figure it out. All right, where do crit values occur? Crit values occur, so part C. 
H has crit values when what? H prime equals zero, H prime equals DNE. So we have to figure out where those things occur. Is H prime ever going to equal DNE? No. Why? What do we know about G? G is always differentiable. What do we know about 1 half x squared? That's a polynomial. That's differentiable. So this is a combination of differentiable functions. So H prime will be differentiable as well. So now we need to figure out where this equals 0. So so let's take it over here. Do we, is this it? Oh, we got to explain a little bit. So we'll have to do some work. H prime of x equals g prime of x minus x. Yeah, that's easy. Equals 0. So g prime of x equals x. That's what we want to figure out. Where does g prime, oh man, sorry. Where does g prime of x equal x? So we want to figure out where are the locations where the slope of this graph is equal to the x value. Well, look at the slope all through here. The slope here is up 1 over 5, 1 fifth. Are there any of these x values equal to 1 fifth? No, no, no. What's the slope here? The slope here is 1, 2, 3 over 1. So the slope here is 3. Are any of these x values 3 in between? No. So that can't be any place. Now let's look at this one. What's the slope here? Down 3, down another one. So down 4 over 2, so negative 2. Are any of these slopes? Yeah, that would have been easy. These, this is a negative slope. Are any of these slopes equal to a negative number? No. Now in here, things get a little sticky because, like, I could picture. So, like, for instance, right here, this slope is 0, right? This slope is positive, but those wouldn't be, I don't think there would be any places, but let's try to set up a little bit more. Let's think a little bit more. All right, I think I screwed that up a little bit. Let me talk about this again. The, the calculation is still correct, but my explanation was poor. So we want to figure out when does g prime of x equal x. This is a picture of g prime. Where I was saying this is a picture of, I was starting to, I was talking about the slopes in these sections, and I shouldn't have been talking about the slopes. I should have been talking about the points in comparison to the x values. So I'm comparing the y values to the x values. So let's look at this section again. So in this section, all these y values are between 0 and negative 1. None of these x values are between 0 and negative 1. So we can eliminate that. Remember, we're trying to find the solution. Where does g prime equal x? So when does the y value equal the same number as the x value? What are all these x values? Sorry, what are all these y values? What kind of y value? These are all positive. What are these x values? These are all negative. So those will have no solutions. Now in here, we find our first interesting spot because these y values are positive and these x values are positive. So there's somewhere in here that we have to have a solution because we go... The y values go from zero, from 2 down to 0. The x values go from 0 to 2. Somewhere they have to cross places. Then in here we go again. Look at these y values. These y values go from 0 to 3. These x values go from 0 to 3. So or Sorry, from 2 to 3. So somewhere there has to be an overlap. Then these go from 3 until 5. And the numbers go from 3 until down to negative one. So there's gonna be no repeats there. There's gonna be no, no solutions here. But there are gonna be some solutions from here to here. And let's try to figure out where those are. Let's start with the one that's in this section. Well, we first have to come up with the curve, the equation for this circle. Now think back to your conic days, our conic sections. So this would be, I'm gonna draw another 
note up here. This is the a circle. Remember, circles were x squared plus y squared equals radius squared. And our radius would be 2, so this would be the equation for uh, that circle. Now, we want to figure out this equation. We want to write this, though, in terms of g. That means we need to solve this for y. So we would have y equals 4 minus x squared, square rooted, with the plus or minus. Excuse me. So I minus the x squared over. I square rooted, which means I needed a plus or minus. So in this section, my y values are all what kind of numbers, though? So we can eliminate the plus or minus. That would be for the whole semicircle. We can eliminate the, the negative portion because that would be these y values down here. So really, don't need. I wrote it just in case, but we don't really need it. So down here, I can now say g prime of x in that section between 0 and 2 is really just the equation 4 minus x squared. And we want to figure out when that equals x. Well, we could solve this real easy. Who's farthest away from x on the same side? Squared root. So kill it with the squared. Add it over. 4 equals 2x squared. x squared equals 2. Therefore, x equals, and I'm just going to write the root 2 down. I don't need to write both of them because we know the negative will not work, right? We already talked about this section's negative, but the y value is positive. Then where else is our function value equal to the y value? And this one you can just tell by looking. Look, this has a x value of 3 and has a y value of 3. So this is pretty obvious. I'm going to draw another thousandth thing up here. G prime of 3 is equal to 3. So there's another place where we have a possible, these are my crit values. So now I've got to actually check to see if these are, remember, these are crit values. How do we check crit values to see if they're actual um, uh, relative extrema? That's where we have to do the good old number line. So now I'm going to take that up here, see if we can do a number line on this. So root 2, root 3, and we just have really, we only have one function. I'm not going to try to, I don't want to deal with this subtracting, so I'm just going to use the one function g prime of x minus x. So let's just pick some values and figure out what they are. So I'm going to pick some pretty easy values. So here's root 2. So I'm going to pick 0 for something on this section. I changed my color again. So I'm going to pick 0 over here. What's the y value of 0? 2. Take away 0 would be 2. So this section is positive. Pick something between root 2 and 3. Root 2 is a little bit bigger than 1, and 3 is here. So I'm going to pick 2. What's g prime at 2? I'm going to actually, I'm going to go back. This would be 2 minus 0. At 2, g prime at 2 is 0 minus 2. Well, that's negative. So we've got one, we've got one uh, relative extrema. And let's see, something bigger than 3, let's pick something easy like 4.5 because then I can just plug and chug. 4.5 is going to be 0 minus 4.5, which is still negative. So this one is not a point of inflection. So dang it, a relative extrema. So now our only point of, dang it, <laughs> our only relative extrema could occur at square root of 2, and it changes f. Our function changes from our derivative. Let me try that again. H prime switches from positive to negative at root 2, so root 2 must be a relative max. Relative max at x equals root 2 because h prime switches from positive to negative 
at root 2. Ooh. Okay, that's it for notes. This is just more practice with these uh, free response questions, but the homework is where you're going to make it happen, Cap'n. Good luck.